My name is Lacey Leone McLaughlin. This is Unfolding Leadership, and I'm very excited to introduce Nicole Neiman Brady. Nicole, the CEO and Director of Sustainable Development Acquisition Corps, a public benefits corporation and pending B Corp, whose mission is to identify and partner with growth oriented companies that are advancing the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. She also serves on numerous boards, including California Resource Corporation, Library Foundation for Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Water and Power and various companies connected with renewable resources. Before this, Nicole was an executive of energy procurement for Southern California Edison, a $5 billion business, and worked with 20th Century Fox, Goldman Sachs, and has a master's degree from Harvard Business Schools. Please join me in welcoming Nicole. Nicole, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here, Lacey. Always a pleasure with you. Uh, Thanks, Nicole. Hey, just to get started, I want to hear a little bit more about your origin story. How did you get here? And for our listeners, what are you doing today? Sort of simplify that. What is the business that you're running actually doing and how is it impacting the world? Sure thing. So what I realized is that uh, all along the way, I had a compass. And really that compass was trying to figure out how I could have the most impact in my career as I could. You know, I started in Wall Street a long time ago at Goldman Sachs. And it was a great foundation, great education in business, finance, deals, et cetera. Um, But really, I I thought my passion was more closer to companies where we could make a more specific difference to the world and to the environment. And so after receiving my MBA, I joined Southern California Edison in the renewables group because then California was where it was at. It was where they were doing all the renewable development in the world and really spurred a lot of the activity that the rest of the world is doing today. Anybody who says, how did you get here? There was no map. There was no uh, exact direction, but I knew, I knew I had my compass. And so as I was at Edison, I just kept exploring different and interesting opportunities and working my way up getting various leadership positions in strategic planning and then ultimately the energy procurement. And, and then to the point when the, the CEO and the chairman said, uh, Nicole, we'd like you to look into water. So that's actually how I got into uh, my water background. I, I did an investigation for them around water and uh, looked at lots of different businesses and ultimately decided to start a business for Edison focused on water treatment and, um, which, you know, living in California, there's tremendous impact uh, you can have with water. From there, I met uh, the folks at Renewable Resources Group who were doing everything I was doing and more. Uh, Water, food, energy, all with an impact focus. Really, it's been quite a journey uh, to this point, um, trying to make that impact even bigger because in my role at Renewable Resources Group, came a lot across a lot of companies that would make great public companies, um, but they needed a little more capital and a, and a little bit of help on that journey. And so that's what I'm doing now. Uh, SDAC is uh, looking for a company that's really making a difference in one of those sectors and trying to infuse them with some growth capital um, to continue that impact on a, on a bigger and broader scale. And plus, I think the market is really interested in having more pure ESG focused companies with everything that's going on in the world and and climate change, no matter what you believe, we need to do more with what we have and we need to be more efficient. And I think there's a a great opportunity for more companies in in these sectors to be public and to give people access to those types types of companies. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. You've used the word impact several times as you were sort of taking us through your journey. Talk about what that means in the setting of business. So what are you doing in terms of finding companies that have impact? And then how does that translate? You know, I don't think there is a clear definition of impact. I think there's no clear definition of sustainability. Um, But I'll tell you what mine is. Impact is when you're working with a business that is really balancing the broader stakeholders, that is not just focusing on the shareholders. Now, look, you have to focus on the shareholders too, but it's balancing it. The environment is a stakeholder, whether it's uh, the local communities. And then in terms of sustainability, I think companies need to focus on sustaining their operations. And the way that we've been operating most of our businesses have been very much short-term focused. And while they have long-term goals, they're typically at the expense of um, the broader 
stakeholders. And so to sustain operations, to have longevity, you need to uh, ensure that your business takes communities and, and other stakeholders in consideration. One of the reasons I was so excited to have you today, Nicole, and you just clarified this even more beautifully than I thought, um, was not only are you a leader leading people, but you are a leader leading the evolution of sustainability for our country and our world, which as a mom of three, couldn't be more excited about. I want to transition to a little bit more of your leadership journey. So talk to me when you think about where you started from Goldman Sachs to today, uh, what are a couple of moments that jump out to you that you're particularly proud of? I certainly was very proud of my accomplishment to be an officer and executive at Edison. Um, I truly had a a passion and a love of uh, what we were doing there, pursuing the renewables development throughout the state of California and, and the West uh, and, and really making a difference there and, and having such a, a large uh, contribution. I mean, getting that role, which by the way, was very fun, uh, which is, you know, a great perk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was fantastic. And then uh, I would say the honor of starting a, a new company for Edison in water and really trying to make contributions on the waterfront. <laughs> No pun intended. Um, and then joining the board of Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. It is now uh, all female-led. All five board members are women, professional women, uh, all from different walks of life, socioeconomically. I also think it might be the largest company that is led that has a board led all by women. Um, it is a six billion dollar organization of revenue. It is a real business for the city of Los Angeles. That is really a, a, a tremendous accomplishment. And then I would say lastly is listing on the, the NASDAQ. That was a heck of a ride. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, raising $316 million in a SPAC oversubscribed significantly and, and just really um, getting that kind of confidence that we could go out and find something incredible. Um, it continues to be a fantastic ride. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, what a great list of accomplishments. And you know, and I know that there is no handbook to get to where you are today. And leadership often looks glamorous. You talk about the NASDAQ and that smile on your face tells me that it was an amazing day. Um, but the reality is the the road is pretty bumpy. On this podcast, I tend to talk to people about those bumps and bruises so people can learn from you and maybe save themselves some of the challenges, some of the obstacles that they've faced. So what are those bumps and bruises? What are those lessons learned that you would mind, uh, wouldn't mind sharing with our, our listeners today? I think everything focuses around people and the importance of relationships. And I say that because every experience that I've had has been, uh, that has been a bump has really been a, an interpersonal one. Mm. And um you know, you may have challenges, you don't get the deal or you don't get the project, um, but those are fleeting. Uh, we're, really what's longstanding is the relationships that you have with people. For me, three overarching things that I've learned that are critical to me getting here and to me continuing my path forward. First thing is surrounding yourself with good people, people you trust. It's all about integrity and you're going to be working with these people and you all, you need to know that you're rowing in the, not just in the same boat, but in the same direction. Mm -hmm. That's a huge lesson. The second one is about the importance of networking. And I think in particular, this is an important one to highlight for women. Well, I think it's important for everyone. I think women tend to sit down and just do their work and believe in their ability to be recognized by what they deliver and everything Everything I've gotten uh, or I've been able to accomplish has been because I've talked to someone, I've learned something, I've connected with someone else. It hasn't been by my efforts, which I always think are very good in isolation. It's always the reaching out. And so for those of you that may be introverts, which actually I kind of am, um, the importance of really pushing yourself to get out there and to have those connections and to develop them, I think are just incredibly important. And the last thing I would say also probably uh, is more important for women, but I would also say it applies to men too, is I never say anything bad, um, particularly about women. Uh, there are 
I think women in the professional setting get a harder rap than than most. There are plenty of people who will be saying negative things about women. In fact, this morning I was on a call where I heard two men talking negatively about a woman. Um, unfounded, frankly. Um, they would never say those things about a man. And so it's just my personal um, effort to never say anything bad uh, about a woman. Frankly, why do you need to say bad anything about anyone? <laughs> We could all use so, a little bit more of that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Particularly around the networking. Have you've had such a good, amazing background and the opportunities and what you're doing now is just so big. Um, have any good stories around how that networking led to where you're at right now? I'd love to hear it. Being on the board of uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Um, that's kind of a funny story in that, uh, I had got as a result of the work of starting a new business for Edison, I was in the water space, got to know some of the team members at LADWP. I got to know the, the folks in the mayor's office. And, um, I happened to live near the, near the LA zoo. I'm a big proponent of the city's facilities. As you are well aware, I have four kids, so we are frequent visitors. And, um, I mentioned to my contact in the, the city that, I you know, I see there's a commission for the zoo. I'd love to be a part of that. And, you know, how do you get your name in the ring? And so it was me putting myself out there and talking to, to the mayor's office. And they said, sure, we'll include your name. Didn't hear anything for a while. And uh, months and months and months. And all of a sudden I get a phone call and said, Nicole, we have an interesting opportunity for you. Would you consider being part of a commission? I thought, yes, here it is. <laughs> and I said, yeah. So I immediately called back. Um, and I get on the phone and they said, would you be interested in joining Los Angeles Department of Water and Power Commission? I thought, oh boy, that sounds like a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> um, frankly, it is. And I was very happy to, but it was a, as a result of those connections and developing those relationships and putting myself out there. You know, I don't know that I ever would have said, oh, can I be on the commission uh, of LAWPP? Um, but you got to put yourself out there for general purposes and be be talking with people and get your reputation known. And I've been in uh, predominantly male dominated fields pretty much my entire career. I'm mostly on my own uh, in m- these meetings. I'm the only woman. And when you're in that kind of environment, you just really don't know. You kind of want to fit in and go along, but you don't really know what else is going on because after the call, they're not calling me to debrief. They're calling somebody else uh, because they're, they know each other. They have those relationships and I just don't know what I'm missing. I've made it more of a point to go out and, you know, call folks, have that debrief, make those connections. And I think every one of those has always proved valuable. Is there something you wish you would have known beforehand? So if you take in all of your years of learning, um, if you take in all of your experience, something you wish you would have known beforehand that you'd like to share with us? Two things. Um, Never be afraid to speak up. You have an idea, say it Um, and say it confidently and clearly, but say it. Just unbelievable how many people I, I haven't heard from me who don't speak up. And I know they're thinking and I know they're smart and I just don't understand why they're not participating. We wouldn't want you in the meeting if you don't say something. You know, I don't want you to dominate the conversation, but, you know, participate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the second thing I would say is that the value of comedy, uh, that's something I've learned along the way. It's particularly valuable for women. I would say two things. One is there was a study a long time ago. I'm not sure who came out with it. It might've been an HBS study that said that um, women who make jokes or considered uh, more likable and diffuse some of their toughness. Mm. So if, if you're tough and then you come in with jokes, it's more palatable for folks. And then just recently, I would say maybe two weeks ago, um, there was a study released that indicated if a woman fails on her joke, that no one holds it against the woman. But actually, if a man does, they're much more criticized. So yet another piece of evidence that making a joke, even if you fail, is beneficial, um, that it shows you're human and you're relatable. So that was something that I kind of picked up along the way and I think has helped uh, me professionally. Uh, And I'll tell you, I make a lot of uh, jokes that fall flat. Uh, I think I have on this podcast alone. So uh, Uh, I I think you're funny. 
Does that count? I totally think you're funny. So going back to your early career, some of the first times you were invited into the room and you were sitting there and you were thinking, oh, I need to speak up. I've got something to say. I've got to contribute. I'm a little nervous, uh, but I know it will add value. Do you have any of those moments that you would share with us that uh, might we might find entertaining and maybe a little funny, Nicole? Uh, maybe this wasn't a funny story, but, uh, I remember, uh, right when I started at Edison, I, um, was the type of person I'm always prepared. I had every file and document. I had my notes. Uh, I wanted to make sure I had everything, but I didn't feel comfortable speaking. So I remember going to a meeting with the CEO, with my boss, and, um, I was going to go sit in the back of the conference room. And he said, no, 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 come up. And I sat down at the conference room table, you know, a little nervous right next to him. And he's having the discussion, he's contributing. And at some point he gets asked a question um, that he didn't know the answer to. He didn't remember the numbers, he didn't have the file. And I had the paper with me. I had the numbers with me. Of course you did. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, and I slipped it out and handed it to him. And he turned to me and he said, of course you have this. And he said, you share. And I remember thinking, oh, okay, here we go. And there was no time to think. It was just, all right, well, this is the situation. This is what we should do. And here are the numbers. And I was all of a sudden just thrust into it. It was partly that I was prepared, um, which is kind of something I always like to be, but it was also just, I had no choice. It was just kind of thrown into it. What experience have you had putting or thrusting people that have been a little bit more junior or new to the experience into that limelight? How are you bringing people out and getting them to talk, knowing that it's so important and knowing it's something that people struggle with? So I think sometimes uh, some people think I throw them into the deep end far too early, <laughs> I have a, a, an analyst currently who uh, is fantastic, and um, he's just not classically trained in finance. He came to work for us in a very circuitous way, and we're really working on developing his financial skills. But as in it, from an interpersonal and a research perspective, he's great. I just threw him into a negotiation. He's American, by the way, with a Mexican uh, farmer to try to buy uh, his land and come up with a deal and come back to me with what the best opportunity would be. And he said, are you kidding me? And I said, well, how are you going to learn if you don't try? And he was like, well, can you guide me a little? And I said, of course, I'm going to guide you. I'm going to be behind the scenes the whole time. But you're the front and let's figure this out. I think he had fun with it. He learned a lot and he just went and did. And was it perfect? No, but nothing's perfect. So who cares? You know, just go and try. And so, so did he get the deal? Uh, he got a deal. We decided we didn't want to do the deal uh, for other reasons, but uh, he did a fantastic job. Uh, I don't know that he could have done a better job. Other thoughts or ways that you've sort of helped bring people along, whether it's the networking, whether it's the speaking up, whether it's the comedy component. You know what um, surprised me recently? One of my team members, a uh, very brilliant woman, um, Stanford MBA, um, very talented in so many different ways, um, came to me and said that me just being in the room gave her confidence to do things. And I was really taken aback by that um, because, you know, you forget sometimes that you're being a role model. One thing that was interesting when I started the water company for Edison, I don't know how this happened. It was not un intentional. My initial team was 11 people. Of the 11 people, eight were women. Of the 11 people, six were diverse. That is not the makeup of the water industry. That is not the makeup of the energy industry or finance. And these individuals are all unbelievably talented. And so I think there is something about being a female leader that also provides comfort in people applying for positions. Mm -hmm. I also am more likely to advance people on potential rather than on evidence um, of things that they've done. And so um, I think those are two ways that are a little bit distinctive in the style, in my leadership style, and, and, and at least um, how it's played out. So much of what you've talked about, whether it's your lessons learned or your stories or the way you form teams is around sort of the EQ, sort of the ability to manage the people component and your own reactions and realities and things to that extent. Why does diversity of thought and helping people speak up and knowing the importance of people, why does that all matter from a leadership perspective? Why do you give a damn? I, 
because uh, people is the real capital. Uh, that is the the crux of any organization. Uh, you may have great wires, you may have great pipes, you may have great Tesla cars that you're manufacturing, but if you don't have the fantastic people that are on your team and have the integrity, then you re- you will eventually have nothing. So um, that's why I, for me, it, it's paramount. It's It's critical. Have there been opportunities where you've had to remind yourself where doing the right thing for people was important. It was paramount. It needed to happen, but it wasn't always the easy choice. I would say actually quite the opposite. Uh, The hardest day professionally for me ever is clearly when you do layoffs, but also I did one day where I had many, many layoffs to do. And of those, I think there were 14 in one day, 12 of them really were people who were not suited for the roles and, and, but two we're very good people, but we just no longer had uh, a position for them. And that was the hardest day professionally because you need to do what's right for the organization and for the company. But at the end of the day, these are these are people and mm-hmm. it is their lives and their livelihood. For the most part, these individuals have contributed to the successes you've had to date. They've been critical to your, your accomplishments. And being mindful of that and being sensitive in those kind of environments, um, it was hard. It was very hard uh, and draining. Um, And uh, I I would say those kinds of situations have been the hardest for me, for sure. So what'd you do to get through it? How'd you find the grace to get through it and do it well? It's about respecting the people and and, uh, understanding their perspectives and giving them the opportunity to to convey whatever is on their mind. Don't think that someone didn't yell at me or say unkind things, not about me, but about just overall the the organization and and what was going on. And and that's hard too. It's hard to take because in some ways uh, you may just be a messenger, but knowing that it is right for the overall business and ultimately for all of the stakeholders um, is hard, but uh, true. Yeah. So I'm, I'm taken aback in a, in a, a really positive way by just your, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you're just your, your, your ease with vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Right. So you've mentioned a couple of times, like I've made jokes that haven't landed and I've had to let people go and it was hard for me and it hurt. I don't come across a lot of leaders that are willing to be that vulnerable. And I think the world is a better place for it. And people recognize that they don't have to be perfect. So how did this come about? How how are you so insightful about how you show up? I think it maybe was lessons along the way that just being myself and being authentic is really all I can be. And pretending to be something else was never a good idea because I'm not a very good actor. So um, might as well just be who I am. I I would say if I were to characterize myself as something, it's probably earnest that uh, has, for the most part, served me well. Uh, People know what they're getting with me and I'm pretty direct and blunt. I don't uh, beat around the bush much. That has served me well. And maybe I've doubled down on it a little bit too much, but it is what it is. And Uh, uh, that's what I'm sticking with. So you would say earnest today, but that leads me to the question, when you started your career, what would be the word that described you? Ambitious, maybe with a chip on my shoulder. (laughs) Ah, 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 okay. Interesting. I feel like I always had to fight and fight and fight and fight for everything. Um, And uh, I don't think that's changed much in terms of um, still feeling like I have to push And I think in anything that's worth doing in life is worth fighting for. So I'm doing still a lot of that, but there's less of the chip on my shoulder, probably. I feel very comfortable with who I am at this point. So following that, if a young leader and or a young diverse female leader were listening today, what would your advice be? And would your advice be different? There's a funny podcast uh, called The Big Fib. And it's about, uh, they bring on two people that they both uh, convey that they're experts on some subject mm-hmm. and one's a liar and one's not. And, and you have to figure it out. It's a kid's podcast. And I am floored every single time that the more confident one is the one that the kids believe. And you can pick up sometimes some clues of things that they say that make it obvious, but it, the subtlety is not always clear to the children. And They just, whomever is more confident, whoever spoke with the more authority, they believe. And so 
it's reinforced for me that you must have confidence in yourself. You must speak with authority, believe what you're saying, but say it firmly. Um, because frankly, you know, a lot of people are not, you know, they're making it up, faking it till they make it. And a lot of that success comes from confidence. Now, I don't suggest you fake it, really. Um, but, you know, you can push the limit and, and a lot of women need to do more of that for sure uh, when they're in the, in the work environment. Lastly, last thing, how if somebody is trying to find that thing that they're passionate about, that they can build a career from, you seem like I can, I see your face light up when you talk about renewables. I see your face light up when you talk about the impact that the businesses you're creating are having on the world and the boards that you support are having on the world. How does somebody find that passion that leads to a career? When I was in business school, I didn't I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And it was very frustrating to me because so many folks were so certain that they wanted to go into private equity or I wanted to be in you know marketing or I wanted to do a startup. I didn't have that kind of clarity. Um, all I knew was that there were areas that were of interest to me. And so I think that's what's important. It's finding what interests you. And if you're working on something, do the best you can, because it's really important to, to develop the relationships wherever you are. But if it's no longer interesting, if it's no longer working, then you pivot. You create optionality for yourself constantly. That I think is the, the, the greatest lesson I've done for myself is always having optionality because you can never know if a situation is ultimately going to be the, the best one for you. You can find passion through options. Uh, but if you're kind of stuck without any, then you may never find that passion. Passion through options. I, I really like that. And thinking about the people and the diversity of thought and the willingness to speak up and the networking. So, so many lessons and good pieces of advice today. Any final thoughts before we say a final thank you? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's You are who you are. Not everyone's going to love you and that's okay. But as long as you're doing your best, don't be afraid. Great way to leave us with Be Brave. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today. It was an absolute pleasure and I can't wait to watch what you continue to do. Thank you, Lacey. What I'm left with is the vulnerability and the confidence that Nicole leads with. She's clearly comfortable in her own skin. And we know with everything happening in the world, with COVID, return to work, working from home, social dynamics, that employees and teams and people want to see their leaders show humility, humanity, and just show up in a real authentic way. So my questions for today are, how do you balance vulnerability and confidence? How do you show up? Or is it time to pivot? This is episode two. Thanks for listening. See you next time.